or something. So anyway, what what you were saying was is that you're basically you're practicing out of a book. Is yeah. that what you're saying? Okay. Well, without trashing any particular book, we can just go ahead and trash them all. You can't can learn Dhamma or meditation out of a book. It cannot be done. Just as uh, someone is going to learn to be so excellent at the violin to become a violinist, a uh, concert violinist in front of an orchestra playing a concerto, there's no possibility for that to happen without several teachers along the way. In fact, the better the violinist gets, the more uh, excellent a teacher he needs. Now, you can play honky tonk just by watching it being done. But even so, you still had a teacher at it. Not possible to give somebody uh, a piano that's never played the piano. Let us say they're in isolation ward because they're in prison for the rest of their life. And you just put a piano in there. You think he's going to become a concert pianist? With all he's got is that piano? No. <laughs> Not going to happen, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the problem with meditation in space, because many times even the teacher doesn't know the problem that's going on with the student, because it's all done in the mind silently, and it cannot be heard. So that means that the teacher has to listen carefully to what the students do say, and to watch their body language, and so that's kind of... <laughs> Yeah, I, I was turned off by teachers before because I went to uh, a TMI retreat, like the official retreat residence there, and um, I had a teacher, but she was basically just telling me stuff from the book, and it's like, I already read the book, I have like, kind of personal issues that I'm dealing with that it doesn't seem like a lot of other people deal with. There are a lot of people who deal with those issues, but it's not really addressed well, in the book. No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. First off, let's go back just a sentence. Okay. These are not personal issues. These are human issues. They're only personal because you say they are mine. And when you say some people, what that means is they may have the same issue, but they don't grab hold of these issues. It's quite the strength that you're grabbing hold of them, claiming that these are my issues. And a better book won't stop you until you listen to what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because actually, that's the problem is when you say they're my issues. Otherwise, an issue is just an issue and it's not a problem. So this is the first step is to recognize we're so these these things that you're calling problems within the Buddhist concept, we can call that dukkha. Right. And we can say that dukkha has a cause. And what is that cause? Basically, it's wanting the things to be different than they are right now. We want things to be different. We, we want enlightenment, something we don't have. <laughs> and we want to get rid of these problems that we only have because we're clinging to them. And in fact, if you just uncling and let go of the problems, you'd be light enough. Get rid of that burden and you're pretty lightweight. So basically, enlightenment is nothing but lightening up. Just lighten up. That's all you have to do. <laughs> Stop wanting it. You already know how to lighten up just by dropping your problems. The teaching yeah. to the Buddha is that simple. It's just merely really good advice that covers all problems because we're dropping just all problems. All we have to do is remember to take that good advice. So uh, I struggle with that a bit because it's like I have I have things I don't like. Uh, Why? And I don't know how to stop liking them. Um, let's say like pain. Oh, well, 
The first thing is, and Goanka says, talks all about this, is that it's not pain at all. It's just bodily sensation. You call it pain because you don't like it. And therefore it is pain, but it's only pain in the mind. On the skin is only an irritation or a message, sometimes a loud message saying, leave me alone, let me heal when it's a broken arm. But basically it's just information. And when we teach, when we understand that the body is just a friend who's just, you know, poking us around, having fun with us, then the body's not in pain. Especially if it's in a sensation that we really, really don't like, then that's when we bring on the lion's roar and said, I can handle this. I'm stronger than that pain. I will endure this. But otherwise, pain is just a sensation. The problem with pain is you don't like it. When you see that lot not liking it directly, then you'll say, wait a minute, I don't have to have this feeling of not liking. I can have the feeling of a lion instead and tell myself, oh, that sensation is just a really big sensation, but I can handle it. Would it be helpful to stop calling it pain and just call it a sensation? That's all it is. I mean, you're manufacturing the pain by calling it pain. Huh? I said that's deep. No. <laughs> no, that was something in the book. <laughs> you just didn't pick up on it. No, yeah, it, it was definitely in the book, but I mean, um, <laughs> there's, there's like that logical understanding and then the emotional one where it's like, I have the pain, I don't like it, and I'm concerned about like what's going to happen in the future and all that regarding the pain. That's why these Skype videos are so valuable. It's because we can talk about things that are important to you, but we can reframe them so that we can see those things more clearly. And look how much we've done. We haven't even talked about your first problem yet. <laughs> and you're saying that because I don't have any? <laughs> well, you, that's up to you. <laughs> uh, okay. yeah. I just sent a video out, not a video, but an article that was in the Lion's War on Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa, and the title of it is Kama. Well, <laughs> the choice is yours. You can believe in karma if you want to, or you can finish with karma. <laughs> Why play the game? And in this case, the karma is the, uh, the things you want to do to get rid of your problems. The action. Why take any action? Why not just ignore the problems? Trying to let it soak why, not, why, why, why not be happy right now? I mean, while we're talking on Skype, at least, you cannot go off and solve those problems and fix them and do things, take actions, only to suffer the results of those actions a little later, which will just create more problems. The solution to this problem is just the next problem. <laughs> and somehow when we talk about it like this, you know, that's right. That's exactly correct. I manufacture my problems one at a time as I think about them. This is why the Buddha was so keen on teaching students to stay out of the past, because all the problems you've got are things that happened in the past. And you want to fix them in the future right now, in this moment, you can at least recognize that these things are not problems, not while you and I are talking together. The only reason they could be problems is because you would rather think about them than listen to what I have to say. <laughs> Uh, 
And everything about the teaching of the Buddha really has to do with be here now. Danny's just sent me something. Hang on a second. Okay. okay. He sent me a link. No, never mind. Now I got it. There you go. Okay. <laughs> um, so, while we read the book, it's almost like too much. An example would be like reading a book of mathematics, because this actually happened to me in university, because I was very keen to get things done. And the course was actually on calculus. And what I did, I read the first chapter, got it. Then I read the second chapter, and I got it. Then I read the third chapter, and I'm lost. And I read the fourth chapter, and I was disgusted with calculus. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Because I didn't do what was needed to be done. I needed to do the exercises at the end of each chapter. So that I really did understand what was done at, at uh, chapter one and then chapter two. That's the thing. And everybody in the Dhamma would rather read a Dhamma book than follow uh, uh, and do the exercises at the end of the chapter. Because really it's all about correct practice, not which correct Dhamma books you read. <laughs> it's why I like your method. Correct. I think it's so simple. It's got a huge basis underneath. It's got complete foundation. The complete foundation actually is founded in, and this is in fact the teaching of Anapanasati, with all sixteen steps based in the four. Uh, foundations of mindfulness and Anapanasati is practiced with the four foundations of mindfulness in order to fulfill the seven factors of enlightenment, the seven bojani. And this, uh, the sambojana is in fact an alternate way of looking at the eight whole noble path, but you have to read other suttas to put that together. And along with that, we understand that we have to go past the um, four foundations of mindfulness into the five aggregates and, and reevaluate things in the sense of what is self and what is not self. And this is a prelude in the Paticca Samupada, which is the 12 steps of depending origination, which is in fact what the Buddha, they say, was doing during the night going forward and backward. And so this is the way that I teach. I teach normally going forward so that the students will understand and then we start to practice going backwards. And why do we go backwards to it? Well, we go backwards to it because it, in forward motion is considered as cause and effect. This cause of that, which turns over that, which fills up that bucket which turns on that faucet, <laughs> which turns the whole thing into a Rube Goldberg machine. And when you see how this Rube Gold machine operates, you end up with a little thing of dukkha. <laughs> and so what then we do is, that, OK, well, now let's start looking at this thing in reverse and start figuring out how this sequence of events wound up that way. And we find that, oh, there's several key points in there that really need close attention. Like the language that we use and the feelings that we have. And in the language that we use, we're actually not talking about necessarily the language that we're using between each other on Skype, but the language that you use within your own mind that you would be called thinking so that you wind up deciding, I'm not going to let the mind have uh, unwholesome thinking. I'm going to keep the mind focused on wholesome thinking. And that that becomes part of the practice. To not allow the mind to dwell in hindrances, now that we know what they are. And yet everybody reads about the hindrances in the book to say, dang, that's right. But then they don't ever practice to make sure that there's none of them there. <laughs> And so the best way to do that is begin to say there is no past. 
Let's stay out of the past. And if you stay out of the past, automatically, magically, you're not having any problems right now. You can't have any problems unless you dig them up out of the past. The only other kind of problem you can have is be sensation, which would be in the present moment. Pain, as you mentioned it. So now you've got the past and the, and the present covered. And when you realize that nobody's got a clue about the future, better not to plan. And almost all of our plans come from repair jobs about what we're seeing in the past. We see the past, we find a problem, and then we want to go fix that problem so that we'll feel better. <laughs> But in fact, to be recognized, oh, right now I don't feel well, then let's look at that feeling and work with it so that we begin to feel well right now without going out and making a plan and fixing anything. Let's feel better. Sit down and be happy and shut up and do nothing. Or as in Zen, they say, no place to go and nothing to do. And the spring comes and the grass grows by itself. So a whole lot of nothing is what you'll get out of Buddhism. You're not going to get anything. You're not going to get enlightened. You're just going to be free of a whole lot of gravity once you start putting things down. <laughs> like the so last. I actually really like do nothing practice. It feels it feels pretty good, but I get a lot of hindrance of doubt because I'm like not sure. No. Whether do nothing that I'm talking about is the result of correct practice. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and that one way is to do it directly. Just go there. But when you're there, you just used it. Oh, I practice that. Well, no, <laughs> when you're practicing that, you're not, you're not actually doing it. And uh, and not only that, but you're saying, but with it. So I already hear that much of, of, of your conversation. So I thought I'd stop you there to recognize, oh, no, when you really get to the point where you can sit down and do nothing except laugh at how beautiful everything are, is, then the really only thought or feeling that, that would occur is, my, wouldn't it be nice to spread this stuff? This this stuff called Buddha Dhamma is so delicious, I should spread it around. It's almost like humanity finally getting fire. You know, one dude got fire. If he kept it to himself, humanity would have never discovered fire. Oh, no, fire is something that's easily spread. And so we spread fire. Let's spread the Dhamma. Let's spread a different kind of fire. One that wakes people up, gets them happy so that they don't have to uh bowed and scraped to big business big government big education and big religion we can be free from the world just hang out <laughs> i think you're saying basically keep doing mindfulness of breathing as formal meditation but do nothing is basically the destination destination exactly and that destination is not a destination off in the future. It's a destination that can be had immediately by merely practicing it. But that's another aspect. Everything is done in the here now. Nothing is done for future benefit. Because who knows what's happening in the future. Let's practice now for the benefit of right now. And that's how we practice Anapanasati, for immediate relief from problems. <laughs> Why? Because we decided we were going to watch the breath rather than worrying about our problems. So immediately you have relief. Isn't that yeah, amazing? My, I've always thought, well not always, but for the past two years I was meditating and thinking like, happiness is not now or relaxation is not now. That's something I need to attain in the future like jhana or stream entry, something like that. But that's the Western mindset. That's how you were taught. The whole culture operates like that. Where the Buddha's whole teaching is about getting out of that and coming and living in the present moment happily. You'd be surprised at how much 
the human society that we have built up on planet Earth is actually just instinctual behaviors that got piled one after another on top of each other over the centuries until now we have an extremely complex culture, but no one in that culture is really happy. But the only thing the culture can do for you is to prevent bedlam. But even after we have peace on the streets, we still don't have peace of mind. But when people realize, oh, if people have peace of mind, there'll be peace on the streets. You don't have to get peace on the streets. You just need to give people peace of mind and nobody's got it. That's why there's no peace on the streets. So in that regard, what is modern society is nothing but who's got the biggest gun. So this is in fact the second fetter. The first fetter is to understand that all of the stuff that you've been learning about karma and uh, religion in the sense of things that happen way off in the future or way deep in the past are not associated with the teaching of the Buddha that the Buddha's teaching is about here now. In other words, it's not about what happens to me is because what happened to me and what happened to me will cause what is going to happen to me. And recognize, oh no, comma itself, action and the results of actions is not personal. An example was Hitler did not experience the results of all his bad action. A whole lot of other people experienced the results of his bad action. And what did they do? They decided to create more bad action on their own part in revenge. <laughs> and so samsara rolls on. So in that regard, karma is not personal. Don't own it. Don't look for me in there in the sense of it's my problem. Just allow problems to be problems, but they're not yours. And in fact, what makes them problems is partially because they belong to the society. They don't belong to you. You've just decided to own them. And I say that in general, because as we've already discussed, I don't even know what your problems are. <laughs> but I can say that that's true about all problems. There is a bit of an exception in that, and then the exception is, is that the Buddha teaches that there are the four requisites. We have to have four things. Now, those four things are adequate housing, adequate clothing, adequate food, and adequate medical care. Now, for most of the monks, adequate medical care means seeing a doctor once every 35 years or so. But I exaggerate just to make a point. Um, meanwhile, the, the little hut, the kuti, or even in the time of the Buddha, a nice comfortable place under a tree. I mean, people go camping even today. And it, you'd be surprised to see that the monk's stuff that he carries along when he's out walking on Tudong is enough to make a perfect campsite. And when a whole lot of monks are traveling together, they can use each other's robes for all kinds of shading devices and pillows and all kinds of things. Because they're required to carry that huge, heavy sankati, the heavy robe. That's the one that they always drape over the shoulder while they're still fully robed. People say, what's all of that about? Oh, well, that's his tent. <laughs> when he goes camping. So we can see that oh, all right. So all we need really is to think about things that we actually need. And when we have those filled, there's nothing left to do all day. <laughs> A simple life is simply wonderful. <laughs> uh. 
I laugh because there's always I always feel a need to fill my day with uh, stuff that's going to improve the future or whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> but by doing so, you're not making a better right now. Yeah. So that's the that's the paradox. Is is that by making a better future, we're not making a better now. In that regard, have cell phones really made an impact into the levels of happiness of this new no. cell phone generation? No, nope. no. Nope. Do you think that Tesla and electric cars is going to increase the happiness? I mean, they might the thrill. I mean, those are really fast cars. <laughs> but thrill is not the kind of happiness that we're talking about. We may improve conditions in the society with technology. But the real issue that everybody's hungering for is the joy of success that gives them comfort and security. Everybody's looking for these things, a, a feeling or a sense of being wealthy or well off. But we're always looking for the outside world to get those feelings rather than seeing directly that they can be manufactured right there within the mind. And in fact, I've used a particular list of words because they correspond to a list in the suttas. Ending with wealthy, but in fact, the feeling of wealth is the most powerful concept and therefore would be the first definition of idiopata. Along with success, security, feeling of uh, contentment, feeling of um, the Pali word is sukha. Now, sukha is normally in, in Thai language is used as the opposite of dukkha. But sukha really is a really satisfactory place, a place that you like so much that you do not want to get pulled out of it. This, by the way, is step, step six of Anapanasati. That step called sukha, to get in that state that's so satisfying that you don't want to get out of it. And for that reason, you really start to stand on guard about what thoughts you let in the mind, knowing that wholesome thoughts are quite okay, but unwholesome thoughts are going to make you feel bad again. So what are the unwholesome thoughts? Thoughts of the past, thoughts of the future, thoughts of doubt. Those are, that are just a wandering mind called restlessness, thoughts of worry, thoughts of wanting things you don't have, thoughts of getting rid of things that you own. The whole shtick <laughs> is suffering. And when we see that, we'll say, oh, I'm not going to let any of that stuff in. I'm going to keep the mind satisfied with what's happening right now. And what's happening right now is basically the Four Noble Truths. Since we, we start paying attention to the Four Noble Truths, we start seeing when, su when suffering is there, ah, there it is. For you, when you say, I've got problems, a better thing to say is, doka, 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 I see you. Goes <laughs> out, you're fulfilling the First Noble Truths. And by seeing it that way, it doesn't take you out of that state of satisfaction. So you need to get yourself into a state of satisfaction. Next time you call, I'll tell you exactly how to get in that state of satisfaction. But you piddle with it and figure out what that means. Okay. You become satisfied. And when you're satisfied, then you want to remain satisfied. And so therefore, you're going to guard the mind to make sure that only really good stuff comes in. This, by the way, can also be thought of or talked about in the form of noting in the Mahasi method. Because what you're noting is what's coming into the mind with the understanding that whatever happens, we're going to keep noting going. And that's what I mean by guarding to guard the mind to make sure that unwholesome thoughts, thoughts about problems, thoughts about the past, thoughts about fixing problems, thoughts about the future. All of those kind of thoughts are to be seen quickly or they'll drag you right out of that satisfying state. Okay. 
Okay. Makes sense. Does it? <laughs> no, it does. I see. I uh, started practicing your method a few days ago, and it was fairly easy to see that when I just focus on the breath, there's, there are no problems. But when I let myself get dragged away, then I get problem, problems again. That's good insight. That's excellent. That's exactly the right way to practice. But there is theoretical underpinnings of that that may, I don't know if you've seen other talks with other students. But in fact, the Anapanasati practice is not like many people think about in the sense of steps. Like a steps or stairs going up to a building and every step leads you higher and higher. But rather think about it as notes on a piano. So that if you did just C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, then that would be the only song that would be possibly sung. But if you don't have to do it in that order, then you can make some really beautiful music. <laughs> and so that's the problem that people have with when they look at Anapanasati, they think that it has to be practiced in a certain order. But the Buddha and Bhikkhu Buddha Dasa will really, really point out, oh no, things need to be dealt with as they arise. Like playing with a whack-a-mole. If you keep watching for one whack -a or one mole to come up, all the others will be up before it does. No, you got to be there to whack any one of them that comes up. And that's the quality, by the way, of be here now. That gives rise to the whole concept of the Zen master with the Zen stick. Who does he hit? If he ever hits anybody, who does he strike on the shoulder? One who's not paying attention? Exactly so. <laughs> and how does he know that? Because when he walks up to a student and not paying attention, the student doesn't do a microscopic change in his posture to alert the teacher and himself that the teacher is standing behind me and I'm about to get whacked. <laughs> and if the student makes such a gesture, he doesn't get whacked. And if he does not make such a uh, gesture because he doesn't know he's about to get whacked, he gets whacked. Including all of the hilarity that kids try to stifle when their buddy gets whacked. <laughs> So that's the point about this practice that a lot of people don't understand. They think that they're trying to get concentrated. Yeah. No. What we're really talking about is getting focused on be here now so that you're in the senses. So that the eyes see and the ears hear. The smell actually does smell. The touch, we can actually touch and feel things. Being in the senses as opposed to being in the mind, that sixth sense that just wallows around in the old crap, bringing up old bad feelings. So better to be in sensual, uh, sensory, not sensual. Well, it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Awareness, the senses, keep things going. Now, if you got your eyes closed, and you're not listening to much and nothing much has happened, that just gives you a perfect opportunity to begin to watch the body, begin to feel what's going on with the body. We do that through the breathing. As we're breathing in and breathing out, we begin to discover a whole lot about the body that we didn't know, including the fact that the body is generally the source of emotions as we experience them. So that we'll have tightness in the chest or maybe shoulders without recognizing that that's what's causing either brain tension from uh, high blood pressure, or the kind of thoughts that are there to try to solve the problem that the body is all tense. But if we can recognize that the body is tense by watching the body, then we can say, okay, body, relax, relax, relax. We have to see it first. And then the body will relax. Simple? 
It is exactly that simple. <laughs> Why do you want to make it complicated? I mean, I don't think I want to. It's just like... Oh, the book like you read is a big book. I get it. Right. Yeah. That makes it complicated. <laughs> I think I just got into a feedback loop of like not really progressing properly because I wasn't really doing it right. Exactly. And I felt like I needed something more to make it work. Welcome to the club. This <laughs> is the fate of every meditator that I know of in the West. But you probably heard that the teachings of the Buddha is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. And there's some other stuff. It, it actually follows with that it has to be taught with right timing and phrasing. So that it remains good. And in that, that way, what happens is students are practicing and they're not getting the good benefit right from the very beginning. Yeah. And so that that then puts it back to a worldly thing in the sense of, oh, well, in the world, if I don't get results immediately, that means I got to wait for my results. But the real world, if you really look at it, oh, I'm not getting results right now. That means I ain't going to be any. <laughs> So delusion comes in. That's the third aspect of the second noble truth. We are deluded about what's going to happen in the future, hoping that things are going to happen instead of enjoying the benefits of what's happening right now, which is all we can ever count on. And not only that, we don't really remember the past very well anyway. And there's a whole lot of stories that I'll tell you on that part. But in that also, past and memories are not reliable. They're not. That's why things have to be so carefully documented. Because the witnesses even don't agree. Court cases are really tough. Why? Because human memory just ain't what it was cracked up to be. Humans are delusional about how good their memory is, and that's a cultural phenomenon. It's a cultural phenomenon that humans have a higher <laughs> opinion of themselves than they actually deserve. <laughs> We're monkeys. We just don't have enough hair. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and we do practice that, that old ritual that we learned from the monkeys, and that is monkey see, monkey do. And that's our society. There is nowhere in there that monkey see, monkey think about, and then monkey decides maybe not. <laughs> yeah. And so we're trapped in this world of doing and doing and doing and doing. And so I invite you to get in that position to where you feel really secure and satisfied and then start making sure the mind is not going to wander into making suffering. And like I said, next time we'll talk all about how exactly to do that. But you already know enough about what we're talking about to start practicing just that. Just get yourself satisfied with how things are, and then be determined to keep it just like that. Yeah. And if the mind wanders away, never mind, you grab it and bring it back. The question is, can you be on guard so when the mind wanders away, you can catch it? <laughs> before it runs away with the whole rest of your brain. <laughs> well, I'm learning it doesn't feel good to let it run away, so, yeah. It's a good yes, to you're beginning to see the, soup, the dukkha in it. That's the whole point. When we begin to see the dukkha itself, then we can make a change. That's the whole point. Excellent. Did it is suffering to think about that argument we, we just had. 
Or the argument we just had. Well, not you and I having an argument. Oh. The one that you're remembering in your own mind when those arguments that we just had, we become they become thoughts. Yeah. All right? That's what I'm getting at. Sorry, I <laughs> didn't mean to mislead you with a metaphor <laughs> to make it literal. <laughs> So this is the way to practice, to recognize that we're not going to let those things come into the mind, the unwholesome. We're only going to allow wholesome thoughts, thoughts about the present moment, thoughts about looking and seeing, thoughts about understanding that things are really nice right now. Let's keep this. Okay. Okay. So next time you call and we'll talk all of the details of Anapanasati in how to bring those things together. Okay, sounds good. Great talking Thank to you. Down, you. Rato. By the way, where are you? Where do you live? I'm in Bangkok right now uh, for like uh -huh. 50 more days. I'm thinking about going to Phuket after that. To Phuket? Yeah. All right, well, if you go to Phuket, you're already kind of in our neighborhood. It's only about three-day bus ride from Phuket to here. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, not, maybe not that long. And besides, the flights between the cities uh, in, in South Thailand are really cheap, under, under like $20, $15. So you can fly to Phuket and then fly to Surat Thani. And then it's really easy to get here. Are there some like Western uh, accommodations there that would? <laughs> Are you kidding me? This is part of the island of Thailand. Oh, you really? do not know Copangan's reputation, huh? I don't know. Koh Samui is the big tourist island with all the fancy places, but this is the. Uh, uh, the backpackers, uh, yoga folks, uh, hippie town. This is hippie town for the world. I might consider that place then. I'll have to look it up. <laughs> yes, do. It's all over the internet. <laughs> it's just a little hard to get to, and everybody likes it like that. You have to take a boat because there's no airport. Okay. So look into that, see what kind of transportation is to here. But also in Thailand, if you would come down, there is Wat Suan Mok, there's the International Dhamma Hermitage, there is uh, a Wat where Westerners are invited to come and live like monks, there is uh, Deepa Bawan where Achan Po uh, stays and they do retreats there. There's also starting up uh, again, uh, retreats on uh, Wat Khao Tum that's on this island. So there's plenty <laughs> of Dhamma. I mean, talking about bringing coals to Newcastle. <laughs> this is actually why I'm here, because this is old home week for me. It's what for you? Old home week. I'm very close to Wat Suan Mok and Achan Po and all of that kind of stuff from 35 years ago when I was a monk in Thailand. Okay. So you go visit those places like the other three weeks of the month or? No, I wouldn't give it anywhere near that much, but at least I can come and I can go, we can contact all of that kind of stuff. Cause I know all of the people and see them on a regular basis. I was wondering about your opinion on that because I looked up one of those retreats and the, the description was like, basically, it sucks. There's going to be like a lot of suckage and it's not going to be fun. No, it seems like retreats are not supposed to be fun. <laughs> it wasn't the retreat that sucked. It was that guy's attitude that sucked. Can't you read that right in the print? I mean, he's telling you, hey, I went to a retreat the whole time I was there. I was suck. <laughs> I was sucking. <laughs> and here's something really funny about that word. When life sucks, why does it suck? And who's doing the sucking? Life sucks because I suck. When I stop sucking on things, 
life don't suck no more. <laughs> so he went to the retreat and he still tried to suck on things and there was nothing <laughs> to suck on. And so he thought the whole retreat sucked. <laughs> Yeah, that's the whole point of these Asian retreats is to get away from your cell phone and your books and your notepad and be with yourself for 10 days on hard concrete floors. It's really illuminating. The mind it is. I mean, the retreats. Yeah. <laughs> It's a big wake-up call, but a lot of people, they don't get it. Now, the down here, at least, we don't do it nearly as stiffly as they do in Burma. In Burma, not only do they do the same exact things, but they sit longer, they walk longer. To where in Thailand, we make it easy on the students. We only have to make them stand on one finger for an hour rather than two. <laughs> <laughs> or something ridiculous like sit <laughs> 30 minutes instead of an hour. <laughs> so, yeah, the retreats are supposed to be tough. Somebody should have explained that to the dude before he took the retreat. He thought he was going to easy town. This is a retreat, like in the sense of going to a resort. <laughs> no, this is the retreat from the world, which means you retreat from all the goodies. <laughs> And a lot of students do these retreats thinking that they're supposed to be cheap entertainment for 10 days. So naturally, they'd come away walking from away from the retreat saying that it sucked. Well, of course it did. That's what you were doing when you were in there. Only the retreat people didn't give you anything to suck on. <laughs> they didn't give you any fine meals or dancing girls or hula skirts or uh, twirling batons on fire. <laughs> Late, latest movies or anything, they didn't give you any of that stuff. So there was nothing to suck on. <laughs> and the students are, are cautious very carefully to not suck on each other. <laughs> But I like that metaphor about sucking. That's what retreats do. They suck. I might have to try one then. <laughs> okay. I mean, I actually did do one before, and it did suck a lot. But... <laughs> <laughs> now you know why. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're going to be down here, I'd love to see you. You can come sit on the porch for a day or two, and we can chat all the time. Sure. Sounds cool. I've had dozens and dozens of students in the past five years come by. Awesome. In fact, I just got a, 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 a Skype message when you were calling from one of the guys who just left here. He's in New Zealand now doing tree-hugging things. Was that Danny or that was someone else? No, this is Johnny. Okay. No, Johnny is, is uh, hmm. because I met him here in Thailand because he was doing retreats down here. And since then, he's been on the road. There are no actual videos with Johnny. And so you don't know him. But he lived here for at least a week. <laughs> so anyway, let's finish this off and we'll talk next time. But you find out how to get yourself in a, in a state of feeling really good and then you keep yourself there. Okay. Okay. And you don't worry up. about the past. Don't worry about the past. You can already see that's Duca. You ain't got no problems right. <laughs> when you're keeping your mind clean. Okay. okay, Matt. We'll see you. See you, Don Rato. Okay, bye-bye.